Well, the whole world's talking about what happened this week in Missouri, you know, Chris, with this Judge Wimes, this uh, commie Marxist judge <laughs> who struck down Missouri's Second Amendment Preservation Act. And what is what is just absolutely delightful to me is to watch all the media in Missouri, but more importantly, all across the country, crowing as though somehow they sc- they scored or secured some kind of a, a major victory like <laughs> oh my gosh the door brothers did not foresee a commie marxist <laughs> liberal judge striking down missouri's sapa law you know for the few people that might not be aware of this yet just as a quick recap so missouri has the second amendment preservation act our work group joined other forces to help make that all possible the missouri firearms coalition uh is missouri's preeminent ass beating gun rights organization and delivered this major victory back in 2021 and what it says is that missouri cops will enforce missouri gun laws when it comes to firearms ammunition and accessories aka Joe Biden cannot use Missouri cops to enforce any federal gun control. None, none of it. None of it. And this is not an idea that we exclusively dreamed up. This comes from the Constitution. This comes from Supreme Court precedent. The idea of the states giving the middle finger you know, to the federal government is a long and storied history in, in, in the stories of American patriotism. It ripped right out of the Federalist Papers. Originally. Exactly. Exactly. And. So I think that for a lot of people who are perhaps newer to the SAPA fight, this is kind of a new concept, but this is not new. It's not new in America. And, and frankly, it's, it's not new for us and what's happening right now today. Uh, I I think what you're already seeing in the the news clips in the last 48 hours is some of the NPR folks already beginning to freak out like, Oh my gosh, maybe we just played into the door brothers hands because this now is going to go way, way, way higher. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And, and uh, for them to sit there and think that we are somehow shut down by this leftist opinion of a a left-wing activist judge, it's pretty funny. Um, I would say that the, this is a recent development with the with this whole idea of anti-commandeering because it's when it's finally being applied to the issue of the Second Amendment. But the but the problem is we've had to have our country has had to go all the way over the the edge, as it were, towards gun control before the demand for this kind of legislation would yeah be appropriate, would arise, would be supported by the grassroots, and that's exactly where we are right now. Yeah, that's a good point. We we had to have a tyrant wicked yeah. enough, evil enough, demented enough to have a need for this in the first place. And, and obvious so, enough, one that's willing to right. stand there and say the foolish things that they are saying right now. Right. That's yeah, that's a good point. So What's great, though, is that our founding fathers anticipated all of this, <laughs> yeah. and they knew that any time you have a massive country with whether it's a king, whether it's a president, whether it's you know any other form of government, eventually there is the risk that that person or that structure becomes tyrannical against its own citizens. And they knew this was a possibility. That's why they gave us the idea of the sovereign states, which of that state con- uh, conglomeration, the federal government was born. It is not the other way around for those who are yeah, watching. Yeah. For all the NPR pinkos who are watching right now, we don't care what you were taught in school because what you were taught came from a bunch of fellow communists themselves who hate this country. They want you to believe that the states are birthed from the feds, and it's the exact opposite and our our founders knew this and like you said this was the most um, we had to get unfortunately we had to get to a point where we have a federal government that's so out of control there is now a need for the states to, to consider you know what what can we do you know what can we do yeah so, that i'm sorry to break in there but that, that is something that you do not hear from any any uh, public school today that the the states are the parents of federal government Um, And really important to this whole idea of anti-commandeering, which is the state saying the federal government can't tell us what to do, is the founding fathers were very deliberate in how they structured this. The federal government and state government, they are co-equal in power. Neither one can tell the other one what to do and, you know, and vice versa, obviously. So um, co-equal power from the state to the federal government, that's the powerful basis, the foundation on which this is built. So it's time to exploit that. Yeah. Well, it was was funny to me, 
you know, Chris, we uh, we laughed. Uh, NPR got a Pulitzer Prize, which, frankly, they owe that to you, and they owe that to me, and they owe that <laughs> to know. Alex, and they owe that to Ben, and yes. they owe it to the rest of the Door siblings who are involved with this. But they got a Pulitzer Prize from supposedly <laughs> uncovering – this big secret, they they pulled back the curtain and they said that the doors are using gun politics to advance a worldview and ideology, which is not just about guns. And we're just sitting there scratching our heads like, how the hell did it take them so long yeah, to I figure like, this out? <laughs> I mean, it's like, on. wow, you guys truly are Pulitzer Prize winning investigators. You know, <laughs> I've passed constitutional carry in... Uh, three or four, three states, uh, four states, um, passed in your ground law in a couple of states, three states. Now you've passed constitutional carry in Ohio recently. Um, your work there, I think put a, a lot of indirect pressure on governor Holcomb in Indiana and made yeah. him uh, get off his butt. I mean, we, we've passed gun bills, uh, for 15 years, but the reality is that the second amendment preservation act and the ramifications of SAPA law, uh, dwarf, everything else when it comes to the the ramifications the freedom uh, implications of, yeah. of SAPA because when these red states begin to realize that they have the the inherent authority as a sovereign state to tell Joe Biden or any future president to go pound sand that is perhaps the most powerful accomplishment uh to date yeah. and when those red states can say yeah no we're not going to do this that's going to be it's going to be it's going to be a revitalization of you know red, keeping red America red keeping red America free well while federal tyranny exhausts itself and dies on the vine because they lack the money and the manpower to go and have their way with these states you know for all the all the commie reporters watching like this is exactly where we have been heading for a very long time and we knew exactly the ramifications of SAPA and yeah. gosh, I could not be happier right now where we are with this fight in Missouri and the ramifications it has for the entire country. Yeah. Well, when you talk about, like you're just talking about, we've passed gun bills in a lot of different states on constitution or on constitutional carry and on stand your ground and enhanced versions of those things. Sometimes I, like I was telling a couple of gun owners I was talking with in the Ohio state house the other day. Um, that's about what we can do to protect our right to carry and defend ourselves right now. Right. But when it comes to this idea of SAPA law, this is, ab this is about making sure that our kids and our grandkids have a fighting chance to inherit even a, a modicum of what we got to inherit yeah. um, for a country, for states uh, and, and stuff going down the road. And, you know, when we were explaining the power of SAPA to some legislators in the Ohio State House, for example, a couple of days ago, yeah. um, once the light bulb went off in their heads, and this is this is explicitly, this is the, the meat and potatoes of what we're trying to do right now with this SAPA issue on the issue of gun rights, we're trying to get these light bulbs to go off because what happened with this one legislator was, oh, Oh, so I understand. Okay, so we can do this on this issue of gun rights. Yep. But what does that mean for all of these other yes. issues that we're experiencing right now with this federal overreach? Are you saying that this 10th Amendment doctrine, this anti-commandeering doctrine can be used on all these other things? We as a state legislature can do that? And we're like, exactly. Bingo. Exactly. It's exactly what we door brothers are trying to do. I just, I just don't think anybody in the entire gun rights space in the country, I, I don't think, I know that nobody in the gun rights space anywhere um, is 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 using this in the way that we crafted this two years ago, uh, trying to, to use it for. Yes, it's about gun rights, but it's about the 10th Amendment and the idea of Red America staying free. And, you know, I've, I've been uh, pushing SAPA. Well, there's, a, there's a great clip here. Where is this? Uh, here's a, this is NPR wigging out. The Door Brothers are pushing this in Missouri, Iowa, Ohio, Georgia. I mean, I was, I was in the state house in Georgia last week working with the public safety chairman. I, no, he's the re, he's just retired now as the chairman. Now he's on the on the committee. But I explained to him, you know, I was like, the ramifications of this put everything else you've accomplished, you know, in terms of advancing gun rights in Georgia to shame. And I was like, you're, you know, you're 70, 75, you know, whatever you are. I was like. You know, no offense to you, uh, you're not going to be around for forever. But as to your point, Chris, I said, this is what you do today 
to give your grandkids the freedom that you enjoy for the last 70, 75 yeah. years of your life. And yeah. to be totally honest, even people who are not very, um, you know, interested in the idea of state sovereignty or, or, or understand the 10th Amendment perhaps at all, everybody who, who has any kind of morality intuitively understands the idea that our country is hanging on by a thread yeah. right now yeah. and that the rights of our grandchildren for the first time are by no means certain, by no means secure, by no means guaranteed. And this is what we can do right now. And so, that, yeah, you're, you're, you're hundred percent right. Cause he asked me, well, can we, can we use this on the pro-life issue? Oh, yes, I, was like, I was like, bro, they already are in Texas. It's already happening. Others have said, can we use this to defeat a future, you know, masking mandate or future other restrictions uh, and any type of restrictions in the federal. The answer is yes. Because common, when, core, common core education standards, Medicaid expansion, all yep. of these different things that are coming down, that are being crammed down the state's throats. A lot of these state legislators, I've been to these legislative conferences before back in my previous time as a legislative aide. A lot of these legislat legislators have no idea of the tools and of the power that they have as a members of a General Assembly. And that body unified together on this issue would be able to turn some of these states around that are headed in a in god awful direction. I know so many gun owners look at states like California, Illinois, New York, uh, Washington State, um, and, and 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 Illinois, and they think, oh my gosh, everything that I see there is only ten years away from here in my state. Well, you know what? The reason why those states get progressively worse, and some of these states are turning from red to purple to blue is because these general assemblies are not fighting back with the tools that they have. That's why we're trying to get this stuff implemented, enshrined, and being used by these state legislatures right now. So. It's it's almost like <laughs> this was scripted. <laughs> ding, I mean, ding, so, ding. So, and so here's the, and so that's and so that's where we are today. Then right now, so this is this is Judge Brian Wimes. This is Judge Wimes from Kansas City. Judge Wimes uh, was appointed. I have a I have a clip here somewhere. Appointed by Barack Obama. You know the OG Marxist president, at least in my lifetime. Yes. And, you know, we were both there. You know, Chris, we were both there for uh, oral arguments last July. The guy Jason was. July 6th, I think it was. July, yeah, yeah, J6, the other, the other J6. <laughs> An absolute out of control activist judge. He he all but came across the bench at yeah. the state of Missouri's legal counsel who was there to defend Missouri's SAPA law. And he made it abundantly clear that there was no way in heck he was going to uphold SAPA law. And we knew from that day that our chances were between zero and zero percent that it would survive. And we walked out of that court. I remember looking over at uh, now Congressman Burleson, who was there with us, who was the Senate sponsor, and then Jared Taylor, who was the House sponsor. And I was like, boys, that's a victory. And they looked over and said, I, man, he's pretty rough. And I was like, no, nah, dude, he's going to strike it down. And that means that far from, far from SAPA being limited to a one-off fight, in Missouri, we now have a chance to explode the idea of the of SEPA, of the Second Amendment, but more importantly, as we said now, Tenth Amendment and state sovereignty all across the country. And now that's going to that's happen. So for those who are watching and have some of the timing questions, yes, Judge Wimes has issued his opinion, and that's all it is. It's an opinion. Mm -hmm. And he is, for those who aren't aware of the federal court process, you know, he is the lowest rung on the federal bench. So you have your district court judge, you have your circuit court judges, then you have your United States Supreme Court way up here on top. Right. And so this is an opinion from the lowest rung on the ladder. And he struck down SAPA law. But I was talking to our lawyers yesterday about this, and they said, well, what's amazing about his opinion is that he never talks about anti-commandeering, which is the heart and soul of the law. He did not find fault with that. He never mentioned it at all. And he never mentioned any of the voluminous uh, Supreme Court precedent. So when this bad boy gets appealed now to the Eighth Circuit, we have massive guns to fire in the appellate process because this guy never mentioned the, the dual underpinnings of Missouri's SAPA law, the idea of federalism, federalism expressed through anti-commandeering and all. I mean, the Supreme Court precedent is not just like anecdotal. The Prince case in 97 specifically says <laughs> that yes. President Clinton could not force the sheriffs across America to enforce the 
his uh his his, his his gun control yeah the Brady bill the, the gun control bill yeah. it's it's not just like we have a similar theory that we have rulings on we have specific gun cases none of that was uh was talked about in this decision and so I I just um. I think that if you're Merrick Garland and you're Joe Biden, you're sitting there in your little war room. Um, of course, these these are the most effeminate men to ever run, you know, the law yeah. enforcement agencies war. in this country. So <laughs> war room might be might be a stretch. But you know, they had a choice to make, and they could have chosen to let Missouri ride and let it go, or they had to choose to be the tyrants that they are and say, we cannot risk the idea of these red states getting the moxie to tell us to go pound sand. At the end of the day, there was no choice. Uh, um, these tyrants are determined. They have to have the manpower of in-state law enforcement. So they had no choice. But in doing so, God, they took the bait hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, when reading through his opinion a little bit, it looks like he was – concerned with some of the preamble language more than he was with the actual substance of the bill. And since we're trying to move this bill right now in the Ohio General Assembly, for example, which is in the sixth U.S. Circuit Court District, um, right. it's kind of it's kind of handy that we have this opinion now uh, mm -hmm. because we can tweak our language and get it even better. Um, and if this thing is going to the Supreme Court, uh, he just he just tipped his hand. I remember I remember being in that courtroom and thinking to myself, huh, so this guy's appointed by Obama. Is he going to be a classic liberal or is he going to be right. an activist liberal? Uh, because we've had we've had anti-commandeering doctrine rulings before by liberal court justices, Sotomayor, right. uh, for example. So yeah. that was the only question while we sat there. Um, is this guy going to is this guy going to put handcuffs on us and give us the win? right away from the outset or is he going to do america a great big fat solid and bump this thing up all the way to circuit court? You. and that's exactly what he did it's what we call in the old fishing business is called hook line and sinker yeah, and they, uh they just had no choice tyrants are gonna tyrant exactly and they had no choice but again in doing so man they fell for it all the way so from here we have spoken already with attorney general bailey in missouri I'm uh, doing a show with him actually later on today or first thing Monday. So to arrange our schedules right now. And, you know, A.G. Bailey in Missouri, as well as Governor Parson in Missouri, are 100 uh, percent you know, wired for sound on this. And I'm looking forward to that. I would I would dare say that Bailey is salivating over the chance to take this case all the way to the Supreme Court, because I think everyone knows that it's where it's probably going to head. Because the Eighth Circuit is definitely more favorable than, of course, than, than Judge Wimes is. You have. Uh, you, know, you have a lot of different judges there and the complexity of that court uh, and its judicial flavor is definitely right leaning. But, yeah, you might have other cases, other districts, other circuits, rather, circuits, where yeah. they say, uh, no, we don't like it here in the ninth or we don't like it here in the sixth. Either way, whether it's this case or a future SAPA law, which is heading up the circuit uh, uh, program, either way, this bad boy is heading the Supreme Court. And if it, and when it gets there, whether it's you know this year, next year, three years from now, whatever, it will be uh, a game changer for gun owners, but it'll be a game changer much, much more so for everybody who cares about freedom, uh, everybody. And this would never have happened with constitutional carry. You're right. never going to see stand your ground law in the Supreme Court. You're not going to see legislation that we've passed to you know, lifetime carry permits or letting you have your guns on school property, dropping off your kid. I mean, none of these bills would get there. Because yeah, so, at the because at the end of the day, federal government, the tyrants in Washington D.C., always planned to pass gun control at the federal level and then choke it down the states' throats. Yeah. This bill, this idea coming along and getting codified now amongst all of the red states, is preemptively giving the the the, the lunatics in D.C. the the big bird. Uh, as it were, and saying, absolutely not. We're not going to let you do that. N not now, not 15 years from now, not 30 years from now. And as we can see from the last three years of, of, of the direction of our country, we know they want to accelerate and keep accelerating this decline right over the edge as a country. So uh, <laughs> that's that's another reason why this is so powerful. Yeah. You know, what's amazing, what's, what's, uh, what's neat to watch is again, all the, you have every pundit now on both the left and the right now weighing in. That's, and that's, that again, is part of the, 
advantage. You know, in the lat for the last year and a half, it was commies and tyrants in Missouri who were pissed off. You know, media in Missouri who was angry. Uh, St. Louis and you know, and uh, Kansas City cops or their 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 department heads that is who were angry. But this issue is now exploding, and I mean, we feel that calls, and you and I have Chris and or uh, you know, Representative Taylor, who now is on our team, from dozens of lawmakers across America this year, but a whole bunch of them just in the last 48 hours saying, I never knew about this. How can I draft this legislation here in my state? And so when we see NPR already wigging out that, oh, the Door Brothers are moving this in states across the country, you this is you. just the beginning. And I would yeah. not be surprised to look forward down the road. And, you know, back we began doing gun politics in the, oh, 2009, late 08, whatever. You know, we had two constitutional carry states. And you look up now, we've got, what, 26? 25. 25. 25. 25 constitutional carry states. Well, that was great. But the fight for SAPA and the ramifications here are as, as high or higher. We might look forward 10 years from now and see 20, 25 SAPA states, too. And if we do that... Yes. That will, and we as in collective gun owners, if we accomplish that together, that will do more to keep America free than anything else I can possibly think of, short of pulling all of our kids out of public schools and giving yeah. them an actual dose of um, of truth and justice and righteousness and morality. But from a from a political standpoint, nothing more I could think of that could accomplish more to protect the integrity of our country than having SAPA be mainstream in Red America. Yep, preach it. Um, I like to think of it in this term. It's kind of like castrating Washington D.C. when it comes to gun control. They can't do anything if this thing, if this gets on the books all over the country. Like you said, Aaron, we went from two to twenty-six constitutional, uh, twenty-five constitutional carry states. I think Florida is going to join them here very shortly. Um, in two thousand six, it was the first year that stand your ground law passed. Uh, in the state of Florida. And then all of a sudden, boom, a couple years mm-hmm. later, now we have what, 37, 38 yeah, standing tons. ground law states. Missouri is number one on SAPA. I hope that Ohio is number two, but I want to see 35 uh, different SAPA laws out there on the books. If it does that, if we can accomplish that, we can totally destroy, we can neuter the entire gun control agenda out of Washington, D.C. And that's just on guns. Again, uh, when I think of, like you just said, one of the things that you could best do to preserve freedom is to yank your kids out of government school. I think SAPA can be used on the education system in America by the states. I think it can be used to push back against the medical tyranny that we're seeing out of Washington, D.C. I think it can be used on probably 15 other issues just off the top of my head. And the best way to do that is to pave the way forward on an issue that at least the conservative legislators in most states can understand from a a principal, from a, well, from an obvious perspective, they can see the obvious benefits of doing it. Then they can start thinking to themselves, okay, how do we apply this here and here and here? And pretty soon, pretty soon, um, Washington DC is undone in their agenda for these red states, which they uh, have no no plan on uh, coexisting with peacefully. Well, this is the way we fight back. Well, that's one of the, that's one of the, you, you use the word peacefully. I was talking to an old lifetime member of the Missouri Firearms Coalition a couple of weeks ago who did a lot to help um, bankroll our fight to pass SAPA in 2021. And he said, you know, and I'm going to butcher the the number of generations, but he's, you know, it's my great, great, great grandfather, whatever it was who, you know, who he said the last time Missouri told the feds to go pound sand, he said it involved muskets, you know, and it involved, he said, old six guns. And he said, my grandpa, you know, my grandfather was involved uh, in the civil war. And he said, you know, what SEPA is doing has the same impact and it's an absolutely peaceful way to simply not comply with the federal Leviathan. And so for everybody out there who's watching this video and you've been enraged in the past, you're watching Joe Biden, you know, and, and his entire team try to like destroy our entire country and you get angry and angrier and angrier at night. Just realize SEPA is the relief valve. SEPA is the way the idea of the 10th Amendment and the states peacefully non-complying is the way that we hold our country together and do it in a very peaceful way. And so, guys, this is this is the issue of our time as far as I'm concerned. I think, Chris, it's not just us, as we said. Now there's all kinds of people 
who were talking about this was it just uh, yesterday, two days ago, uh, Judge Napolitano, a leading, uh, probably the leader of the, the libertarian uh, thought movement when it comes to legislation in particular, came out with an incredible a video interview with him and a, a, a podcaster, I believe, and we're going to play this at the end of our of our you know uh, you know video here, where he called Missouri's SAPA law the was it the highest or the purest, uh, the most comprehensive uh, expression of federalism since Thomas Jefferson and James Madison opposed the Alien and Sedition Act in 1798, <laughs> and uh, I. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, goosebumps. Yeah, goosebumps, man. I mean, like, we knew this. We wanted to do this from the get go. And now to see how this is playing out in real life, you know, thank God for the members of the Missouri Firearms uh, Coalition. Yeah. Uh, thank America, God. America owes um, uh, a debt of gratitude in, in states all across the country that are going to pass this eventually. They owe a debt of gratitude to the members of MOFC. And Jared Taylor and Eric Burleson for get, uh, for and you obviously for getting this job done as the first pioneer state. You know, I, I love to think of it in terms of that America is such a pioneer country, obviously. Um, but uh, I, I love it when great big huge things like this come along in very subtle ways. You know, I, I think everybody shares this frustration, like. When they see the direction our country is going, and they get angry, and they think of their own legislators, do something, do something. Or they think, oh, it's just too late. It's going to be a powder keg. It's going to come to guns, whatever. All of a sudden, SAPA law comes along. This nice pioneer just like waltzes in the door and says, you know what? We can take care of 99% of this stuff. Just put me on the books. Just put me on the books, coach. Put me in, coach. <laughs> put me in, coach. And that's what we're doing with SAPA. So... Yeah, everyone's playing their part. MOFC members, you know, gosh, so is Judge Wimes. And we thank you for the tyrant <laughs> that you are and for playing the role that we scripted out in advance. We could not be more happy to see where we are today. I, I, again, want to make sure everyone knows this is no defeat. This is an absolute necessary step in the fight as we elevate the fight for SAPA higher and higher and higher. And someday, hopefully very shortly, this will be in the United States Supreme Court as well. We're going to end here, guys, with this clip from Judge Napolitano from two days ago. And you've got to watch this in context. It is amazing. He predicts this matter to go all the way up, to be upheld at each step of the process. And he says, again, this is the highest manifestation of federalism and state sovereignty since Thomas Jefferson. And frankly, that's uh, it's good enough for me. So, guys, you watch bet. this. Share the video online. If you haven't yet and got involved in our fight, become a member today of AFA or the state group where you're watching this at, guys, and we'll keep you informed as always. Judge Napolitano, the host of the Judging Freedom Podcast. Good morning, Judge. How are you, sir? Uh, good morning, Austin. Pleasure to be with you, no matter what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll skip the discussion about the Spanish Armada this morning, if you don't mind, Judge. I, uh, I uh, agree. Look, um, the Missouri had a uh, bill that took um, quite a number of years to pass. It was called the Second Amendment Preservation Act. And very briefly, what it does, for those who might not know, is that it prevented Missouri police officers from enforcing federal laws and put a $50,000 fine on their department if they cooperated with the feds in enforcing laws that weren't illegal in Missouri. They could cooperate with the feds if it was against Missouri law, but the feds had to enforce their own federal laws here in Missouri. A federal judge overturned that yesterday. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, this is really uh, one of the worst judicial opinions that I've reviewed in, in the modern era. If this judge were a student of mine at one of the three law schools on whose faculties uh, I was privileged to sit and submitted this, he would have flunked because he missed the most important case, which is a Justice Scalia opinion uh, called Prince versus the United States, in which the federal government tried to get sheriffs to enforce federal gun law. Yeah. And the sheriff of Phoenix, Arizona, last name Prince at the time, challenged that statute and the Supreme Court said, you can't do it. The feds can't commandeer, Justice Scalia's phrase, local and state um, uh, law enforcement to enforce federal law. The feds want to enact a federal law and they want it enforced, let them go ahead and enforce it. There's absolutely no authority under the constitution whatsoever for the feds to commandeer uh, locals. So this, this judge missed 
the case, now, the, the most important case. Now, I didn't read the briefs, and I'm sure that the briefs supported or submitted by the Attorney General uh, of Missouri cited that case, how he could miss it, how he can get around it, I really don't know. The statute itself is one of the finest demonstrations of federalism since John, uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison dissented from the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798 by writing the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which supported the concept of nullification. If a federal statute purports to violate a fundamental liberty expressly guaranteed by the, by the Constitution, and we know that's the case from Justice Scalia's opinion in Heller and Justice Thomas's uh, opinion in Bruin, then the states can nullify that federal statute within their states. So this federal judge has totally missed the boat. Uh, as for where this goes, I think the, the statute will eventually uh, be upheld. Uh, whoever crafted this in the Missouri legislature has a superb understanding uh, of federalism and superb timing, knowing that with this present Supreme Court itching to enhance the concept of federalism, to, to leave the states to protect civil liberties in areas where the feds failed to do so, here the civil liberty to defend yourself, um, I think the court uh, will will profoundly alter this ruling that came down uh, yesterday.